Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Nirav Shah. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambert, Commissioner Jean Maine's Department of Health and Human Service. Health and Human Service. Commissioner Lambert and I are here today to provide everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine. Across the state of today, Tuesday, July 28, July 2020. And I am just going to just going to throw us on mute before we before we dive in. Before we dive in. We begin today's briefing. Today's briefing on a sad and somber note. Sad and somber note. The main CDC is reporting that two additional individuals with COVID-19 have passed away across the state. Across the state. One was a woman in her 70s from Lincoln County. The other was a man in his 70s from Andrescoggin County. Andrescoggin County. We'd like to offer the friends, offer the families, and communities and communities. Both of these individuals are the deepest condolences. Deepest condolences during this time of their grief. Time of their grief. Overall. Maine CDC is reporting 3,838 cases of COVID-19, an increase of six cases since yesterday. Of those, 3,433 are confirmed, an increase of 11 since yesterday. And of those, 405 are probable, a decrease of five cases since yesterday. And thus, on balance, net of net, there are a total increase of six cases. Among those six cases, among those 3,838 cases, 12 individuals are currently in the hospital across the state, seven of whom are in the ICU and two of whom are on ventilators. As I mentioned a moment ago, a total of 121 individuals have passed away with COVID-19 across the state, and a total of 3,319 have recovered, an increase of 27 recoveries since yesterday. Of our cases, 882 are among healthcare workers. Of those 882 healthcare workers with COVID-19, 815 have recovered. And in Maine, there are no healthcare workers who have passed away associated, to, associated with or because of COVID-19. Overall, Maine CDC epidemiologists have fielded now close to 11,000 requests for consultation from healthcare providers across the state. I'd like to provide an update on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is working on and, and, and involved with most recently. The first is an update on an outbreak I talked about last Thursday at the Marshwood Center in Lewiston. There are now a total of 21 cases associated with that facility, 13 residents and eight staff members. The team at Marshwood is undertaking another round of universal testing today. Results should be available most likely on Thursday. And from there, we'll have a sense of how the disease intervention strategies that Maine CDC has been working with Marshwood on how that has changed the course of the outbreak at that facility. I'd like next to provide some information on three new outbreak investigations that Maine CDC has opened in recent days. The first is one at the Sappy Paper Mill in their, in their Westbrook facility. Yesterday evening, Maine CDC learned of a third case associated with that facility, and we're working with the management of the paper mill to provide more widespread testing across that facility. The second outbreak I'd like to note is one at Central Maine Medical Center, where there are a total of 12 confirmed cases, 10 among staff and two among patients. This outbreak appears to have been introduced into CMMC by a patient. As soon as Maine CDC became aware of the situation, we convened a call with the management and medical and infectious disease leadership of that hospital to work with them on offering testing to a wide array of staff, which they have undertaken, to make sure that the facility had all the PPE that they needed, and then third, from an infection control perspective, provide CMMC guidance and assistance with infection control practices like cohorting of patients, as well as contact tracing within the facility. 
we are continuing to work with CMMC and, and working with them as we investigate this outbreak. The third outbreak that I'd like to discuss is one associated with Hancock Foods, where there are a total of five cases among workers at that work site. Because of when these cases were reported to Maine CDC, they are not included in today's case counts, but I offer them because I'd like to provide an update on the outbreaks overall. They will, however, be included in tomorrow's case count numbers. Additional testing is underway for workers associated with Hancock Foods. As is the case with all workplace outbreaks, we are offering not just epidemiological support, but also social service support to the employees, as well as to anyone affected by this outbreak, in addition to conducting our, our epidemiological and contact tracing investigation. It's important to note that these individuals were identified as part of a proactive series of testing measures undertaken at the facility to identify cases. We will have more updates on, the, on all of these outbreaks as their investigations unfold. I'd like next to provide some updates on where things stand with respect to testing across the state. Let's first talk about positivity rates. As a reminder, the positivity rate is just that. It's the percentage of all of the PCR tests that are reported in the state of Maine that come back as positive. It's one of the finest indicators, not just as to how the contours of the outbreak are unfolding in Maine, but also as to whether the amount of testing that's being undertaken and the locations of that testing are actually detecting new cases. Based on 1,659 PCR tests reported in Maine yesterday, the one-day point positivity rate was 0.96% across the state. But the number that we really look at to give us an indication of how the outbreak is changing and whether our testing strategies right now are sufficient is not the one-day number, but the seven-day number. And for that, that number currently stands at 1.08% across the state of Maine. For comparison, 30 days ago, that number was 1.95%. And nationally, that number is around 9%. For reference, Maine's number right now on a seven-day weighted average is 1.08%. The other number that we take a look at is not just the positivity rate, but the overall testing volume which we measure based on the number of tests per 100,000 people. That number right now over the past seven days stands at 179 tests per 100,000 people. That translates to an average of approximately 2,400 tests per day for the PCR tests that have been reported to Maine CDC over the past seven days. Again, that's approximately 2,400 tests per day over the last seven days reported to Maine CDC. And finally, an, a quick update on the number of tests on out-of-state individuals that are reported to Maine CDC. And again, the number I'm sharing today is not the number of confirmed cases, but rather the number of tests, bearing in mind that some individuals may be tested more than once. Since Maine CDC began tracking COVID-19 numbers way back in March, there have been 145 positive tests among individuals who have listed their state of residence as being outside of Maine. That's 145 tests out of a total now of 149,869 PCR tests reported statewide. I'd like to now turn things over to Commissioner Wambrew for some updates on some epidemiological and scientific investigations that the department overall has been working on. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. So speaking of out-of-state residents, I'd like to give an update on our policy for tourism related to COVID-19. The basic premise of the approach that Maine's taken is to identify by states where residents are generally as safe as those in Maine. The underlying rationale is that if the residents are in a state that's generally as safe as Maine, then by coming to Maine, they do not bring an increased risk of COVID-19 to the state. 
In this evaluation, the state takes into consideration several data measurements and relies on the totality of the evidence rather than one single metric. The weekly positivity rate that Dr. Shah just mentioned is one. We also look at new cases adjusted for population, as well as whether there are different sources of information coming from hospitals or other data sources. We conduct these sorts of analyses periodically, and in so doing, try to identify are there states that are exempted from our policy, which is if you're coming from another state, you must quarantine for 14 days or get a recent test, a test taken no longer than 72 hours from when you arrive in the state. Or if you have a negative test result, you can come and be in Maine like other Mainers and enjoy the state. So we first of all have looked at the policy and maintained the value of testing. We have seen testing in this state has expanded as well as in other states. We have currently six of our so-called swap and tens that are open. People can get testing there under our standing order um, with a fairly rapid turnaround from our state lab. There's another 13 of our swab and sends that we expect to come on online this week. In addition, there are 20 different sites in Maine that are operating under our standing order where people at elevated risk, like people coming from other states, can get tested. So our capacity is good. Our testing requirement we think is a solid one and is actually being followed by other states. And as of today, looking at data, we are not adding any new states to the exempted list. As a reminder, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey uh, are exempted. And those are exempted because those states have similar epidemiological trends as does Maine. That does not mean that residents from states like Massachusetts or Rhode Island can't come to Maine, but when they do come, they must either quarantine or test. As we do these reviews though, we also look at other types of policies. And that includes what more people can do outside where evidence increasingly shows is safe to be around other people um, as we look at our different reopening guidelines. So one area that we will continue to evaluate in the coming days is large gatherings. Is it possible to have large gatherings of more than 50 people outdoors based on the data? That's something that Dr. Shaw and his team are looking at. We're looking at examples in other states and we hope to get back to you on this soon. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaw for questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner. We'll turn now to our colleagues in the media and I will turn to, uh, to Megan from WMTW for today's first question. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. My question is about um, outbreaks. Um, the CMMC outbreak connected with the Marshwood Center. To my knowledge, this is the first time one outbreak has led to the investigation of another outbreak. In terms of, um, at least here in the state, um, in terms of epidemiological um, investigations, uh, is there anything that you infer from that? And I understand that one of the patients had come from Marshwood, but initially tested negative, is there, and then was retested once the outbreak was confirmed at Marshwood. So is there something to be said for um, that test being a snapshot in time that's not necessarily always uh, accurate? Um, so, uh, Megan, let me, I'll start with where you, where you left off on that, that point about accuracy. Um, I don't want to confuse the test for what it is with the test for what it's not. The test is the exact words you described, which is just a snapshot in time. Of in, the, in the face of a rapidly changing outbreak, it's a snapshot of, as I said, a very fast-moving train. Individuals who have been exposed to COVID-19 can test positive initially, and then at a later date, I'm sorry, I, let me state that over. Individuals who have been exposed to COVID-19 can conceivably test negative initially, and then as the virus grows and, and, and expands and multiplies within them, test positive at a later date. And that's because the test is just that. It's just a snapshot of what's going on in the body at a particular point of time. That really doesn't affect the accuracy of the test overall. There's not enough virus in somebody to be detected. That's not a fault of the test. That's not a fault of anybody. That's just the nature of how testing works. That's one reason why testing is not just important once, but over a multiple series of times to make sure we're catching situations like this. Now, you asked about the connection between these two. 
Uh, what it really shows us is something that we've talked about at these meetings, which is that None of us, no institution, no individual is an island under themselves in these situations. Hospitals are deeply connected with long-term care facilities, which are deeply connected with the employees, which are deeply connected with our communities. All of these parts are, all of these players are part of the broader healthcare ecosystem. And we can't, we can't separate them so that what we know is that the best way to reduce the likelihood of any outbreak be it at a long-term care facility or at a hospital, is to reduce the overall number of cases in the community rather than trying to put these different facilities on an island. Uh, I am going to turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, many people, including one of our listeners, are still sick weeks or sometimes even months after initially contracting COVID. They seem to recover and then sometimes have intermittently recurring symptoms. Do you know what the prevalence is of that? Maybe just everywhere and then here in Maine? And then I have a follow-up question as well. Sure. So the, 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 uh, the existence of individuals whose COVID-19 symptoms persist for longer than the 10 or 12 or 21 days that's been described in the literature is a, is a finding that's being investigated more as a scientific matter. The slice of individuals who have tested positive and do have these longer term persistent symptoms is thankfully a small slice. As we've talked about, majority of individuals have symptoms that may not require hospitalization and that resolve in around 10 or so days. But a smaller slice of individuals do have longer term symptoms. Uh, the percentages in Maine as well as nationwide do vary, but it's in the single digits for the most part. And there ha one of the scientific questions that's under investigation nationally is why it is that certain individuals have these persistence of symptoms. It's an open scientific question. I know that there's a lot of investigation underway about that. And right now, there haven't been any clear answers that the scientific community has really come up with. Is anything known about whether uh, people are still uh, able to transmit the virus if they seem to have recovered and they meet the other criteria and then they have one of these flares? Uh, well, I, I don't want to know. I don't really know if it's a flare uh, as much as it is maybe just the continuation of the same symptoms. One of the things we have to bear in mind, Amy, is that it's always possible for individuals to be recovering from COVID and then have a head cold or some other type of cold that could be on top of what they're already having. So what we know, uh, and based on the latest information from the US CDC, individuals may, uh, the likelihood of them continuing to be infectious or contagious, even if their symptoms extend into two or three weeks is not thought to be very high. But out of an abundance of caution, the US CDC's guidelines, which Maine CDC follows, do call for a discontinuation or a cessation of all symptoms just out of an abundance of ca caution. It's not thought that individuals are likely to be infectious, but given the severity of COVID-19, the US CDC recommends and Maine CDC agrees that we look for resolution of all symptoms before we really move folks into that recovered category. And that's for a period of 14 days or is that 10 days now? According to a change that the U.S. CDC made just last week, that period is now 10 days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to turn next to Bob Evans at News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Commissioner Lambert, as you may have heard yesterday, GOP leaders said the tourism industry is hurting. They say a, the big problem is that Massachusetts residents still, as you mentioned, have to either show the positive test or do the 14-day quarantine before coming, and most of them don't want to do that. If Massachusetts residents typically account for 40% of summer tourists, is there a plan by the governor and the, the administration to offer relief to the tourism industry before the end of summer while still balancing safety concerns? Sure, and I'll just start by saying, you know, we care passionately about the tourism industry here in the state of Maine. Many of our family and friends work in it, and we recognize the toll that COVID-19 has taken on the tourism industry here in Maine, as well as nationwide. 
the truth is, is that every state, even states where the tourism policy is different, have seen significant declines in people eating out or traveling to visit. So we recognize the toll that that's taken on our our businesses here in Maine, which is why the governor continues to ask Congress and ask Washington for the kind of relief for our tourism industry that is provided, for example, to the airline industries that brings people to Maine. So we continue to work on how do we support our businesses. But our job here with at Department of Health and Human Services and at CDC is to figure out how we encourage people to come to Maine safely. We welcome people coming from places like Massachusetts if they can get that negative test. We have sites in Maine where people can get can get tested. We are hoping that they use our swab and sense because our lab is fairly reliable, unlike some of the national labs. We don't have that week-long wait for test results. So we really do encourage people who want to come to our safe and beautiful state to do so, but to do so safely. Dr. Shaw? Uh, I have a follow-up on the CMMC outbreak. Sure. Go ahead, Bob. Is uh, is CMC, uh, CMMC the first hospital to have an outbreak reported in Maine? And do you handle these cases differently because they are a hospital? Uh, so, Bob, uh, CMMC is the first instance of an outbreak of COVID-19. Um, well, there have been cases, but... Uh Maine General had one. Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So there, there was an outbreak earlier at Maine General um, affiliated with that institution. That's true. So this is now the second case of an outbreak uh, associated at a hospital situation. And and Bob, the, the bottom line there is that no matter the type of healthcare facility, whether it's a nursing home, a hospital, an assisted living facility, the approach that we take is very similar. Our focus is on first providing epidemiological support uh, to help characterize what's going on. The second is testing and making sure that there is quick access to testing. And then the third is contact tracing, making sure we're equipping them with all the tools they need to trace the exposures to patients as well as other staff. And then the fourth is making sure they've got all the PPE they need. And that applies no matter the type of facility, be it a hospital or a long-term care. Thank you both. I am going to turn to Rachel Ohm at Portland Press Herald next. Hi, good afternoon. Um, two questions. My first question is, how often do you guys review the um, states that are on that list for the tourism restrictions? Um, and could Massachusetts and Rhode Island possibly be reviewed again anytime soon? And my second question is, um, have you, are you aware of any outbreak associated with a, a summer camp at the Saco Community Center, um, possibly stemming from some kind of prom or dance that was held there? I'll take the first question, which is, we try to review weekly, bi-weekly data, because as a reminder, you do need maybe a week or two for trends to appear. So we generally try to check in on these data points. We, we look at them all the time, but really look after a two-week period to see if there's been any significant change. So that's why we're reporting this today. And I would note that when we think through our policy, we are considering whether there are additional states where that could be exempted from our policy. We are not considering repealing our policy as the Republican lawmakers called for on Monday, as the previous question just asked. Um, it's the opposite. States nationwide are beginning to adopt the policy that Maine adopted on June 8th, which is having testing as an alternative to quarantine. But many states are going into the same sort of mode of making sure that when people do travel, they travel safely because we know our policy has been working. We've been open for tourism since June 26. And thank goodness we have not yet seen a tourism related outbreak. And Rachel, as to the Saco day camp that you mentioned, there is no outbreak investigation or outbreak that's been opened at that facility as of this time. I'm gonna turn next to Morgan Sturdivant from WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. Um, my questions are concerning the exemption list and also schools. So I'll start with the exemption list question. So again, it's about Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, visitors 
But we were wondering, what are, are there any specifics that you can give us about what you're exactly looking for when you will be able to add Massachusetts and or Rhode Island to that list? Sure. We do take a holistic approach to all of our assessments, primarily because there's not one piece of data that tells you exactly what's going on in the epidemic or the pandemic, which is COVID-19. Sometimes you look at a, one point and it looks worse than a different point. Things change over time. There's lots of fluidity about this pandemic, which is why we take a holistic approach to it. And I think it's important to recognize that sometimes numbers look like they're close when they're not really. So to take an example, the positivity rate that Dr. Shaw mentioned. Um, if we were to have the same positivity rate in Maine as Massachusetts, which is about a percentage point higher than Maine, instead of having 270 cases in the last two weeks, roughly, we would have had about 780 or 90 cases in the past two weeks. Rhode Island's positivity rate is even higher. We would have had over a thousand positive cases in a two week time frame if our positivity rate were just a percentage point or two percentage points higher. So we do look carefully, but look at the totality of the evidence as we're making these decisions. Great, thank you so much. And um, my other questions are about schools. Just wondering, will the red, yellow, green classifications be announced on Friday? And uh, for parents, teachers, staff who are still, you know, despite the, you know, the guidelines that are being put out, talked about, what do you say to people who are still really torn with making the decision to send their child or to go back to school um, despite all of that? Maybe I'll begin, and, and Dr. Shaw, if you could talk about your recommendations to parents, that would be great. As a reminder, we announced uh, in partnership with the Department of Education that the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, alongside the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, will have developed a system to categorize our counties. These categorizations will be, be based on a holistic assessment of quantitative and qualitative information it will include, but is not limited to, recent data on case rates, positivity rates, and syndromic data that evidence that there are people with symptoms of flu or COVID-19. And we will develop a categorization just for schools. This is not for businesses or restaurants or anything else. It is targeted to schools because when a county is categorized as green, that school, if it has if it feels prepared to have in-person instruction, has followed the recommendations, has followed the department's requirements, it could resume in-person education. If it's categorized as yellow, that suggests that, the, that suggests that the county has an elevated risk of COVID-19 spread and that some type of hybrid instruction, meaning some children are in classrooms, some children are doing remote learning, may be advised. And third, a categorization that's red recommends that there's a high risk of COVID-19 spread in that county and that in-person instruction should not is not recommended. As a reminder, these are recommendations. Every school district can look at what's going on locally in his community, looking at these data, looking at its own readiness and make its own decisions. But we, Maine CDC, Maine Department of Health and Human Services, will provide this tool beginning on Friday for schools to begin to make those decisions. And Morgan, as to the second part of your question, we have certainly heard from parents, teachers, and staff members at schools expressing their concern about returning to the classroom. Now, Commissioner Mambrou just mentioned the color designations that we'll be releasing later this week. But as a reminder there, even a green designation does not mean that the risk level is what it was before COVID, for example. There is still the possibility of some degree of risk or transmission. The green means just that, it's low risk, not zero. And so we have definitely heard from parents, teachers, staff members, as they have expressed concerns and hesitation about going back. Given that these are guidelines, they have to be implemented at not just the school level, but literally at the individual family level. And if you're a parent and you've got a child with a chronic medical condition that you're worried about, and the possibility that there could be a higher risk of COVID-19 for your child, one of the best things to do right now is to check in with your pediatrician, 
for two reasons. The first is to make sure your child is up to date on his or her vaccines. That's one of the surest ways to prepare your child from a health perspective for the possibility of going back to in-classroom education. The second thing is that that visit will provide you an opportunity to check in with your pediatrician one-on-one -on -one to discuss whether your child's particular health conditions, or if you're a teacher or a staff member with your own physician, how you might want to take additional steps as you think about preparing to go back into an in-classroom situation. There's not a single answer for everybody. And the best way to get that particularized advice to either prepare as well as to put your mind at ease is to check in with your physician, make sure you and your family are up to date on all your vaccines and get that particularized health advice as we all get ready for the fall. I'm gonna turn next to Brooke Riley from ABC7. Before I go to Brooke, uh, this is a good opportunity while we're talking about vaccinations to remind folks that Maine CDC, specifically our team of public health nurses, are offering a series of catch-up clinics for parents and families who may have fallen a bit behind on their children's vaccination schedules because of everything going on with COVID-19. We're offering those at a number of sites across the state, and we ask everyone to call ahead Information on those catch-up clinics can be found on the Maine CDC website, as well as that of the Department of Health and Human Services. And again, these are being offered free of charge, being led by our team of public health nurses, providing parents an opportunity to get their children caught up on all U.S. CDC recommended vaccines free of charge as we get ready for the school year. I'm going to turn back to Brooke Riley. Brooke, we'll come back to you in a second, and I will turn to Patty White. Thanks very much, Dr. Shaw. Um, even though we're doing well with testing capacity, I'm wondering what you think about pooling tests. It's a strategy that's being floated around as a way to um, expand the number of people who are getting tested but use fewer supplies. Is that something that you're considering um, using at any point? We are, Patty. We uh, Ever since uh, last week when Quest Diagnostics is own emergency use authorization became approved for pooled testing, we've been studying how and in what ways we could implement that at the state level here in Maine. There are already smaller hospital laboratories that are conducting pooled testing, for example, on patients who might be getting ready to have elective procedures at a hospital. The question for us is how and in what fashion we can roll out pooled testing at the state laboratory up here in Augusta. One of the things that has to happen is for the test that we use, which is manufactured by IDEX, to receive its own emergency use authorization to allow us to do pooled testing. We've checked in with IDEX on this exact question, and they inform us that they're going down that pathway. So that's one of the first things that has to happen. The second thing is we have to work with our laboratory team, because even though it's the same laboratory test, the workflow that's needed to bring it online is different. As your question noted, Patty, pooled testing involves lumping a number of samples together into one pod, if you will, and then running that pod as if it were just one test. And if the pod comes back positive, going back to each of the constituent samples and running them individually to see which one of those was positive. It's a great way to save on resources, but it does require a new workflow to be put into place. So right now we're studying what type of workflow we theoretically could put into place as we think about adopting pooled testing. We haven't made any final decisions yet, but we're studying it right now to see what it might look like at the state laboratory level. Great, thanks. And can you also, um I'm curious what prompted you to evaluate loosening the restrictions on large gatherings. I know you're, you're just considering it, but can you tell us why? Um, from a scientific perspective, I'll, I'll start and then turn it over to Commissioner Wambrou. From a scientific perspective, there have been some recent data that have been published in the scientific and clinical literature that suggest um, that, that, that have better characterized the lower risk of outdoor activities. It's always generally been hypothesized that outdoor activities as compared to indoor activities presented a lower risk. 
perhaps because individuals are more naturally spaced out, perhaps because of the impact of UV light, perhaps because of more cross ventilation. A lot of theories have been out there. But in recent days and weeks, really, there have been additional papers that have gone through the proper scientific process that better characterize that. One of them, for example, and just one I'll, I'll pause on, although there are others, is a study that suggested that the risk of transmission from outdoor activities, at least according to this one study, is approximately 20 times lower than the same type of activities were those activities to be held indoors. So it really is because of the changing scientific landscape, moving from hypothesis to now better data that has prompted us to undertake this review. Commissioner, anything else? Nope, and nothing to add. That's exactly the review we're conducting, as well as looking at what are the different operational considerations that we would consider. Mm -hmm. You know, Patty, it's, it's fundamentally about safety. Uh, and, and if the activities can be done in a manner that is safe, as in moving things out of doors, that, if that's the idea, we then look for data to support whether that can be done and whether there's scientific evidence in favor of that. And there seems to be more data emerging with respect to the relative safety of outdoor activities. The yeah. key there is relative. There are no zero risk scenarios, but relatively speaking, there seems to be some added protection from being out of doors. Yeah, and just uh, to reflect the governor has continually said that it is a matter of balancing reopening opening, getting back to as normal as we can in a safe way. And every time we have an opportunity to figure out a new way for people to be able to engage in a way that's safe, that protects their distance, that you know, respects the need for face covering, that otherwise allows for a re-engagement of main people and main businesses, we welcome it. Could this impact fall sports? I mean, make it easier for fall sports to move forward? Sure. So what we were talking about, we'll come back to, to Dr. Shaw on sports specifically. I think we have been thinking about this in the terms of gatherings, which tend to be things like weddings or religious gatherings or other types of gatherings, where again, that might be possible to increase the number in an outdoor setting than an indoor setting. Again, this is under review. Um, sports are a little bit different than gatherings. I don't know, Dr. Shaw, if you want to talk about the engagement that happens in sports. Dr. Shaw, we can't hear you. All right, so since we're having trouble with our audio from Dr. Shaw, uh, I'm not sure who has our next question. Would that be Brooke? No, Brooke. Oh, wait, I heard somebody. No, let me see if there are other questions on the list. Just one second. Uh, Morgan, I think we got Morgan's questions, but let me double check. Morgan from WABI, do did we get your questions? Yep, we got my question already. Good. Thank you. All right, I think Dr. Shaw was giving me the universal signal to say thank you all for your attention today. We appreciate your questions. Apologize that we couldn't really get to your sports question. I could try to answer, but I would not give the same high quality evidence-based answer that Dr. Shaw would on sports. Um, again, we encourage people to look up those public health nurse clinics for our childhood vaccinations. They're on our department website um, right there in a press release. And with that, we urge you all to have a good day. Stay safe and be kind. Okay.